And good morning, South Bay Bible Church. This is Pastor Matt here. Happy New Year. It's our first Sunday as a church together in 2022, and I am actually away at a conference right now, uh, being fed by the Lord just to start our year off right as I seek to lead us in the way of Jesus. And and since I'm away, uh, our elders and myself had been praying about who would bring the word for us today? And the Lord just revealed to us, let's ask Miss Ellen Wilsinski. She has an incredible, an incredible word this morning to bring to you from Luke chapter 9. And it's going to be so good for you. And I've, I've read over it and, and I've just been personally ministered to by this word. And so I'm excited to hear what the Lord does through her teaching today. And I just pray that the Lord blesses you and keeps you as you continue through this next week. Let's welcome together South Bay Bible Church with a warm welcome, our very own Miss Ellen Wilson. I'm smiling because every time Pastor Matt introduces me, I'm reminded that I haven't been Miss Anything in like 43 years. So his introduction just somehow makes me feel so much younger. And I thank him for that. It's a wonderful thing when we get to send our pastors on a conference because, you know, he's so dedicated to making sure we all get fed and, and our spiritual selves are taken care of. But where does the pastor go to get fed, right? Well, they go to conferences and we get to send them a couple of times a year where they get refreshed and restored and inspired. And he'll be back next week. But for this week, I am so honored to be able to come and share a message with you today. Um, first of all, I have to say, don't you just love the thought of a new year? I just love the thought. It's a reset, it's a refresh. I just, there's something so hopeful and promising in beginning the year over fresh. And um, what I wanted to talk today about is how we can begin any new beginning in a way that will ensure an ending that is well done. Because isn't that what we always want to hear? Especially when we do something for our Lord and Savior, we want that well done. So I have to, I have to just give you a little background. A few years ago, several years ago, quite a few years ago, I started this holiday tradition, and it's, it's not kind of what most people would think of a holiday thing, but it's watching The Incredibles 2 in 3D. <laughs> and this all started when one particularly hectic holiday, my youngest daughter, Tracy, and I decided to give my oldest daughter, Michelle, a break and take all four of the grandchildren to the movies. Now, I have four grandchildren, Nick and Serge, they're 20 and 22, big guys now. Stephanie and Grace are almost six and eight, but they were all younger at the time. And what you need to know is two of my grandchildren are autistic. So when we endeavor to do something like this, you always have to have a contingency plan. There's always got to be a plan B because you never know if one or several or all of you are going to have to get up at a moment's notice and go. So we scoop them all up, Aunt Tracy and I. We go to the movie theater. We get our tickets. We get our 3D glasses. We get our snacks. We map out where we're going to sit. Tracy's on one side, the two little ones in the middle. I'm on the end because we need containment. We don't want any runners. Nick and Serge, they're te almost teenagers. They're old enough to sit behind us. So we start to watch the movie, and we're into the movie a good bit, like 20 minutes into the movie, when I feel Sergio behind me, and he says, Grandma, I don't like this movie. Grandma, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. And I'm like, here we go. So I said, what's the matter, buddy? He goes, it's a stupid movie. I can't see it. I can't see it. It's fuzzy, Grandma. So I turn around and look at him, and I'm like, buddy, where's your glasses? And he goes, in my pocket. I says, no, you need your glasses. You have to put them on. I don't wear glasses, Grandma. I don't wear glasses. I'm saving them for Tracy. She wears glasses. And now I'm going, okay, I've got it, because autistic kids process a little differently. They have handed him something that he doesn't need. So he'll just save it for later. So now I'm going to explain. And I said, no, Serge, you have to put the glasses on. These are special glasses. They will help you see the movie. I said, look around. Everybody's got the glasses on. And then comes the question, do you want to put your glasses on? 
okay, Grandma. So he puts his glasses on. There's three seconds of holding our breath, and he goes, Grandma, this is awesome. <laughs> Grandma, I love this movie. I can see it all clearly. Grandma, this movie is alive. And I've often thought of that as a metaphor for South Bay Bible Church because here we are all about fitting you with the spiritual glasses you need to see life from a godly perspective. The spiritual eyewear, if you will, that will let you look into the Word of God and have it literally leap off of the pages at you so that you can apply it to your life. So we're watching The Incredibles 3D, and for those of you, I can't believe there are any, but for those of you who haven't seen it, you will want to go see it. This is the ones where the kids take a little bit more active role in saving the world. And they get themselves into some situations that would be dangerous for anybody, but definitely dicey for kids. And at one point, Mrs. Incredible, Elastigirl, she just has the heart of a mom. And she looks over at Mr. Incredible and she says, they're just children. They're just children. And he says, you know, they are just children. But they're children with power. And because they have that power, that makes them special. Now, whether or not they decide to use the power is up to them. But they have it just the same. And I look out at all of you believers you beloved of God, created in his own image, we are his children. But we're not just children. We're children with power. Yes. Whether or not we decide to use that power is up to us, but it has been given to us just the same. See, what I don't want, I don't want to get to the end of my time here and realize I had all this power and I never took advantage of it. There's a piece of scripture that has for a while spoken to me about this very thing, and I want to share it with you. As Pastor Matt said, it's in Luke's gospel. If you have your Bible and you want to turn there with me, it's Luke chapter 9, if you still use a paper Bible, otherwise your tablet or your phone or whatever device that will get you there. If you do not have a Bible, we do have Bibles for you under the chairs. And if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that one home and make it your own. We love to give Bibles away here. If you're going to use the Bible under the chair, you'll be looking for page 589. So this is Luke chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 and then skip down to verse 10. So Luke chapter 9 verse 1 says, And he, Jesus, called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. And he, Jesus, sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. Now down to verse 10. When the disciples returned, they gave an account to him of all they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed them. And welcoming them, he began speaking about the kingdom of God and curing those who were in need of healing. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away that they may go find into the surrounding villages and countrysides and find lodging and something to eat, for here we are in a desolate place. And he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and purchase food for all of these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now what I love about the Apostle Luke he was a physician, you know, so he was all about details. So when he lets us know that there were 5,000 men, what he's letting us know is there were many, many more who weren't counted. Biblical scholars estimate that there may have been as many as 15,000 people there. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate 
and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, twelve baskets full. Now you probably know or have heard the story of feeding the multitude. But I want to just for a moment forget about the multitude here and focus in on the disciples. I want to focus on those who have a close relationship with Jesus, who walked with him and talked with him and followed his teaching. Those of you who have a relationship with Jesus, who get up early on Sunday morning to come to church or to tune in, those of you who carve out time every week to be in a community group, those of you who lead and disciple and have a heart to see people saved. The 12 have an up close and personal encounter with Jesus. And we find this story also in Mark 6. What I love about the first three books of the gospel, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is that there's this synergy in the way the stories are told. There's just this synergy in their texture and their meaning. And if you read all three of the accounts, you just get so much deeper. It's as if somebody said to you, would you like some chocolate cake? And you say, of course I would, because no one ever said no. And they say, well, you have the option of a one-layer chocolate cake or a seven-layer chocolate cake. I don't know about you. I'm taking the seven-layer chocolate cake every single time because the more layers, the deeper and richer and fuller the experience. Mark 6 is your seven-layer cake. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to read it now, but I encourage you to read the account in all three of the Gospels. So Jesus calls the 12 together. We learn in Mark 6, 7 through 12, and he sends them out in pairs. He sends them out two by two to the surrounding communities and villages, and he gives them an assignment. He instructs them as well. He tells them, don't take a lot of money with you. Don't even take food. Make sure you bless everyone who wants to know about the kingdom of God, and don't spend any time with unscrupulous people. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the assignment was that everywhere they went, everyone they encountered would have a clearer picture of who Jesus really is. They were to go out in the power and authority Jesus gave them and do miracles and teach and preach and show the people who Jesus really is, that Jesus could do exactly what he says he could do, that he is exactly who he says he is. The whole point of the disciples coming together and then being sent out is that they would operate in such power and authority and integrity and love that every interaction they had would leave the people they encountered knowing this Jesus is the real deal. Because church, really, what is the point of us coming here today? If after we leave church, after we leave our community groups, the people we encounter don't know that this Jesus we follow is the real deal. So the disciples go out they in, in pairs, and they handle their assignment with integrity, fully entrenched, Mark 6 tells us, in the task at hand. When they are finished, they come back to Jesus and they give an account of how they handled the ministry that was entrusted to them. I want to make sure that every one of you here today knows that you are in ministry. If you have trusted the name of Jesus and his finished work and you call him Savior, you are an ambassador and you represent him to everyone everywhere you go. Do not let somebody convince you that ministry only happens in the front of the room with a microphone behind an instrument. Ministry is the place where you have been called to save. It is the assignment that you have been called to do. You are in ministry. You parents of small children, 
every time you sit down with those children and you give thanks for all that is provided or you teach them a biblical principle like forgiveness, don't let anybody tell you you don't have a ministry. And you single men and women, every time you stand for integrity and righteousness and purity and demand to be treated in a manner befitting the son or daughter of a king in your relationships, don't let you tell anybody tell you that you don't have a ministry. You corporate believers, every time you sit in that meeting about future forecasts and present, pro, projections, and you notice a lack of integrity in that plan, and you stand up for what is right and what is true, you have a ministry. Beloved, every single time you tell a friend that you are praying for their parents, their children, their grandchildren without ceasing, you have a ministry. Amen. Just like the disciples, the day is coming when we will have to give an account of how we spent our time and talent and the abilities he gave us. And listen, this is what I know for certain. He's not going to ask me about your assignment. He's not going to ask you about the assignment he gave me. He's not going to care how many followers we have on Twitter, how popular our tweets are, or how many friends we have on Facebook. He's going to ask me how I took care of the assignment he gave me to do, and I will give an account. And you will give an account as well. And when I give that account, I want to hear well done. Well done. Anybody here interested in a well done? I want to hear well done. Which means my priority cannot be to please you. And your priority cannot be to please me or anyone else. Our only priority has to be well done from our Lord and Savior. The day is coming sooner when we think that we will give that account. I remember the day I got a phone call for urgent prayer. And for those of you who don't know, this is a phone call that there is an immediate crisis and the body of Christ is being called together to storm the gates of heaven with fervent prayer. James 5.16 tells us the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And in this case, a friend's son was moving furniture and he collapsed. He was going to the hospital unconscious, not breathing. An hour later, I got the call that he was gone. Father of two beloved son, cherished brother, in an instant he stepped out of history and into eternity. See, we don't know the hour. We think because we're young, we have more time. We think because we still have a list of things we want to do, we have more time. But there is no guarantee. Tomorrow is not promised. I don't know about you, but this year I am committed that it is time to just get busy. Church, just get busy and do the assignment. So for the disciples, the reality is when they came to Jesus and they gave their account, he gave them a well done. He acknowledged that they had done the assignment he had given to them. In fact, he acknowledged that they were tired. He could see they were exhausted. They were just flat out worn out. Anybody here tired? Right? I understand. I acknowledge your commitment to come here this morning. You know you'll get refreshed. You know there'll be fellowship. But it was a cloudy, rainy day and you could have slept in. I see your commitment. Jesus sees your commitment too. And Jesus saw their commitment. So he notices how tired and exhausted they are and he says, come away with me to a quiet place. Not go and rest and come back and then I will use you. No, he says, come away with me, not go away from me. When you are exhausted, an intimate relationship with Jesus is your rest. Yes, take a break, scale it back, rest, but rest in Jesus, not from Jesus. The truth for every single believer is you will never find rest and refreshment apart from Jesus. Jesus is your rest. 
So I want to give you three steps to begin in a way that will ensure a well done. The first one is, he called them. There are so many layers here. Jesus came down to earth and became flesh so that we, they could behold him, so that they could see what God was actually like. He met them where they were. He taught them and loved them, and what he did for the disciples two centuries ago, he does for you and I today in the person of the Holy Spirit. We are privileged to be indwelt with the Spirit of God so that we can hear him when he calls us. It is the Holy Spirit that will call you and compel you and convict you and challenge you. You will feel it in that innermost part of your spirit. It's that feeling that had you come today. It's that yearning for something more, for a relationship that is somehow deeper. It's the desire to serve and to see people saved. That is the Holy Spirit of God calling you. When the disciples heard that call, there was no other earthly priority for them. They laid down their nets. They left their businesses behind. They walked out of the fields to go. May it never be that we put our ambition higher than God's calling for us. May we be willing to leave behind our desires our ambitions, to be about what God is calling us to do. Father, forgive us when because of stubbornness or pride or fear, we leave your calling to fulfill our desires above your will for us. Forgive us when we pursue that which was never ours to go after, when we walk down paths you did not send us. He called them. Step number two, he gave them power and authority. He gave them power and authority. That meant they did not have to be afraid that they could not do the assignment. They did not have to fear that they wouldn't be able to do what they were called to do. See, even if you don't have the ability when you're called, he will supply everything you need to succeed. He calls us and he empowers us. Jesus does not call you because you have the ability. He calls you and when you say, yes, Lord, send me, he supplies all of the power, all of the authority that you need to complete the assignment. Listen, he is not going to call you to a task that he intends to go undone. Now, there is an enemy who hopes you will go out in your own power. There is an enemy who hopes that we will think we are gifted enough and talented enough and strong enough and smart enough on our own. What he doesn't want is a believer who goes out in the supernatural empowerment and the anointing of God, knowing that the glory is his. It is his supernatural empowerment that makes you the parent you were meant to be the career person, the friend, the mother, the father, the minister, the disciple you were meant to be. It is not by our might. It is not by our power. It is by the Spirit of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. I love this verse. But we have his treasure in earthen vessels of clay, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. He called them. He empowered them. And finally, he sent them. He sent them. Resist the urge to send yourself. Ask me how I know. Resist the urge to do an assignment before the appointed time. Wait for him. This is so critical. Church, if you begin the assignment before God's appointed time, you will squash the character and the spiritual maturity that he is trying to develop in you. The character and spiritual maturity that you need, you will sacrifice it if you go before he says go. When you go ahead of God, that spotlight you stand in will burn you to a crisp. 
When you go ahead of God, the applause of other people will become a weight and you will not have the spiritual maturity to bear up under it. Wait until God says go. And when he says go, just like the disciples, you go. Now I want to talk to you for just a minute about the multitude. Jesus said, come away with me and rest. Anybody think it's a little odd that when they went with Jesus, there was a multitude waiting for them, pressing in on them, weighing down on them? Is there an impossible situation weighing on you? Do you have a multitude pressing in? Maybe it's finances or family or relationships or kids or a job or a health diagnosis. There is wisdom for us in these verses. It says that they told Jesus, send the multitude away. How many times do we say to Jesus, send the multitude away? Just send it away. We don't just say it. We pray it. Lord, send it away. But Jesus, in his wisdom and in his sovereignty, knew that there was refreshment in the multitude. When the multitude got hungry, the disciples said, send them away. We have no food. We can't even go buy food. We're miles away from everything. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. They said, Lord, we have five loaves and two fish. Send them away. But the account tells us Jesus welcomed the multitude. What Jesus welcomed, they wanted to send away. How many times do we pray, Lord, I just long to see you do a miracle in my life. And then we follow that up with, Heavenly Father, please keep me out of any situation at any time that might actually require a miracle to be done in my life. Send it away, Lord. Send it away. Listen, don't be in such a rush to pray away your multitude. Instead, look for your miracle. If it weren't for the multitude, they never would have been able to participate in the miracle. If it weren't for the multitude, they would not have even seen it. They not only got restored and refreshed, but they got to see exactly what Jesus can do with a little bit. Listen. <clears throat> you take what you have and you put it in Jesus' hands and you watch him multiply it. You watch him put his favor on what you have and make it more than enough. You take your talent, your faith, your uncertainty, your inability, your fear, and you put it in his hands. You will have everything you need to succeed to his glory, and both you and your multitude will be blessed. Every single well done we will ever hope to hear will be because of what Jesus does through us and how we respond. Just as it was for the 12 when he called them, he empowered them, and he sent them. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that, that every single well done we hope to hear begins with you, Lord, not from ourselves, Father, we know that there is nothing we bring, Lord, but only what you give that makes it possible to do anything for you. Father, I pray that we will be sensitive to your Holy Spirit so that we can hear you when you say, will you come? So we can hear you when you call us. And Father, I pray that we will be confident, not in our own ability, but in your supernatural empowerment, Lord, knowing that you will not call us to a task you intend to go undone. And Father, most of all, I pray that we will be willing, that we will be willing servants, Lord, who when we hear that call, will step up and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Because, Father, in that there is refreshment. We will be blessed, and those who we are sent to will be blessed as well. 
Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the privilege of speaking to your people today, Lord. I pray that you will bless them mightily, that you will suit a blessing to each person who is here today, to each person who is online today. And Father, that you will bless them richly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Ellen, for that incredible word this morning. I just know that everyone who heard that message today was blessed by the Lord and ministered to in a unique way. At this time, we are actually going to move into our time of worship through giving and generosity. And we don't believe this time to be a break from our worship, but actually a continuation of our worship to the Lord as we gather today in this house. Right now, this Sunday, we are actually smack dab right in the middle, right in the center of our annual All is Bright Christmas offering for this year. Now, our Christmas offering is different and separate from our tithes and offerings, and the Lord instructs us to give in our tithes and offerings, but this is a special offering that goes towards three ministry initiatives that we, your pastors, your leaders at South Bay are asking you to give towards, which goes towards three things, such as our local missions, which includes all of our, 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 our marketing and our local events that we have, and then two large family-focused community events, which will include a spring block party as well as a fall uh, festival and then finally our third ministry initiative which is our benevolence and biblical counseling ministry where we help people in their greatest time of need and so this is a very special offering right now we are right at the halfway point of the offering but we're also at the halfway point of our our goal for this year so we are just over forty two thousand dollars is is where we're at including the matching funds and so remember we have that up to $42,000 of matching funds where every dollar that you give towards this special offering actually uh, it doubles. And so for those of you watching online, for those of you joining us in church, be sure to give your normal tithes and offerings as the Lord instructs us to do towards the ministry, but also to consider what the Lord might have you give towards this. If you haven't given towards this Christmas offering, I want to encourage you to pray about what the Lord would have you give to this and and, and to give just this very special and your, and your best gift towards this special offering this year and if you have already given towards this Christmas offering pray again that the Lord might have you give a, a, another amount of some kind towards these special ministry initiatives that we want to be able to participate with the Lord in next year that he is inviting us and calling us into in this coming ministry year and so at this time our ushers are going to go ahead and receive our offering as well as our communication cards and if you believe Jesus for the first time today Day. We want to know that. So let us know in the back of your communication card and, and drop that in and we'll be able to send you some resources for growing in your relationship with Jesus. Our ushers at this time can go ahead and receive our offering. Well, why don't we all stand for the benediction? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this congregation of believers, Lord. I know that they are beloved to you. So I pray, Lord, in the week to come that you will bless them and keep them until we are together again at our appointed time. Amen. Go grab a cup of coffee and a donut, peoples. <laughs>